I want to move on here and talk about uh, dividend ETFs because a lot of companies are cutting their dividend here. I just want to point out today, um, 114 companies in the S&P 500 has suspended guidance, uh, and we're only 60% through earnings season uh, so far. That's a quarter of the S&P. Uh, 79 have suspended the buybacks, and 31 have cut or suspended the dividends. And most of them who've cut or suspended are consumer discretionary like retailers and energy stocks. So it is a particular uh, subsector of the market that's cutting the dividends. But uh, Simeon, I want to weigh in because you run one of the big dividend ETFs. Uh, you run the Dividend Aristocrats ETF, symbol is N-O-B-L. I wonder, this is a little teaching moment to educate us because there's a number of different dividend ETFs out there. I wonder if you could tell us what goes into that, how do you determine what goes into that, and how are these dividend cuts affecting something like N-O-B-L? I'll try to keep it relatively compact, but the key difference here is between ETFs that focus on dividend growth and those that focus on high yield. So Noble is absolutely in the dividend growth camp. And the rules for inclusion of the index, we follow the S&P 500 Dividend Aristocrat Index, is 25 years of uninterrupted dividend increases, and then the portfolio is equally weighted. This is a very high-quality portfolio, and that, I think, is much of the key here. You know, if you look at, as an example, take the S&P 500 by quintile by credit rating. Half of Noble's constituents are in that first quintile. If you looked alternatively at a high dividend ETF, like a DVY, only 10 to 15 percent of its constituents are in the first, quartile, or the first quintile of, of credit rating. So that's really important because what we've seen is the high yielders with the lower credit rating have actually underperformed in this downturn even though interest rates came down, which should have helped them out a little bit. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. So, Dave, we've debated this for many, many years, and I think uh, Simeon gave a very good summary there. Generally, if you're a dividend investor, you want to buy companies that are consistently growing their dividend over time, which is noble, of course, um, versus just buying the highest yield. Now, and so yeah. under some circumstances, if the market's going up, that'll work. Uh, fine. But in this circumstances, obviously, a company, uh, an ETF like Noble matters here. Can you refine that a little for us? What, what observation yes. would you make for dividend people? Yeah. So what we're seeing here is a real division in the market between winners and losers. And I'm obviously not the first one to say that. And the winners here, I think dividend increases or at least dividend consistency is a pretty good quality proxy. Right. If you actually look at people who've reported what hasn't gotten reported very much is that folks like Apple and J&J &J and Costco and Newmont, they've all actually increased their dividend this quarter, which I think surprised a lot of people. Now, that's because of two reasons. One is these are companies that have the cash and cash flow to support it, but it also signals management confidence in their ability to weather this storm. So obviously, there'll be some changes here. I would not be surprised to see some shifts even in something like Noble because not every one of those holdings is going to be able to keep this up. But regardless, I think that portfolio will continue to be a bit of a winners in this market portfolio because it is that proxy quality. So I agree. Yeah. I think it's a terrible time to be chasing yield, but it's a great time to be trying to find quality cash flow positive companies. Well, Chris, weigh in on this. Um, we, we've been talking about the difference between dividend growth and those that have a more emphasis on, on a higher yield uh, in their ETF. Uh, how worried should we be about defaults? going forward? How, how likely do you think they are? What, how much are we going to be dealing with that? I mean, well, I mean, the good news is, is a lot of the dividend ETFs are, are underweight energy and underweight, you know, some of the oil sectors that the concern for default is the highest. Uh, look at Makai Shields, which is one of the York Vice Boutique, you know, high yield and investment grade and municipal managers. Um, you know, we talk about these things often uh, in our muni products and our high yield products. Uh, the default concern right now is not incredibly high in, in certain parts of the high yield universe. Obviously, if you look at, you know, state uh, general obligation bonds and, and utilities, sewer and water and things like that, it would be a much lower, lower risk. But if you look at, you know, retirement yeah. facilities and things like that, the risk might be a little bit higher, Bob. So it really depends on what yeah. the funds are holding and what the active manager is going into, um, you know, to qualify that answer. And, and Simeon, a a apropos of what you were saying here, if, if you want to chase high dividends, you, you do end up with generally more energy stocks, as Chris was saying. So I'm looking at ETFs that have energy sector concentration. Uh, the iShares core dividend, the symbol is HDV, 20% of their shares 
uh, outstanding are energy stocks. Uh, Noble has only, it says here 2.8%. I don't know if you, if you know that off the top of your head, but um, a pro share is that the Noble that you control only 2.8%. So there's a very wide range of what you can hold in terms of high dividend in some of these uh, stocks, um, um, Simeon. No, I, I, I think that's right, Bobby. You see more energy the more you're stretching for yield. So Noble just having a small amount. The other thing I wanted to note, because this is the ETF show, is one of the key advantages of of owning a basket like this in an ETF like Noble, which is, uh, you know, to Dave's point, yeah, are a couple of names going to cut? Sure. But guess what? When you own the ETF and you're following the index, if a company gets cut, then, and by the way, you want it to be cut from the index because a cutter typically underperforms. So when it gets cut, the proceeds are then invested pro rata across the other, other constituents. So as an example, if you go back to 2008 and you look at the S&P 500 Dividend Aristocrat Index, it lost names in 08, but the dividend actually went up. You could try to do that yourself. You're going to have to. It's a little cumbersome. You have to. You're going to have to sell it. Then you're going to have to move your proceeds around. But owning it in an ETF takes care of that uh, logistical issue for you. And it's another. It's another. Well, piece it, of the is puzzle. that going to happen now? Is that going to happen well, now? You've lo have you lost any names? Is the dividend going up? Are we having a, so, a 2008 uh, moment here with that? There haven't been any names cut so far from the S&P 500 dividend aristocrats so far. So obviously we monitor that and we think there'll be far fewer cuts than in the broader market. But just as that extra layer of belt and suspenders, when if there is a name cut, you could actually see the dividend go up. It might stay flat. It probably won't change too much because you're, you're automatically reinvesting uh, across the rest of the portfolio. So it's kind of two layers of protection. Fewer will actually cut their dividends, and even for the for the small amount that would, you're redeploying those assets seamlessly in, in the ETF. 